Okay. Yep. Good morning, everyone. The Deputy Attorney General and I are joined today by leaders from each of the Justice Department's law enforcement components, the FBI, ATF, DEA, U.S. Marshals, as well as leaders of other department components. I've convened this group to discuss two areas of continuing concern to the department. First, combating violent crime. And second, prosecuting and deterring those who would criminally threaten public servants, including law enforcement personnel, members of Congress, judges, and election workers. First, with respect to violent crime. We know that hard-fought progress can easily slip away, and we must remain focused and vigilant. That said, we are encouraged by the data we are seeing indicating a decline in homicides. The FBI has reported that the number of homicides fell over 6% nationally between 2021 and 2022. And the Major City Chiefs Association has reported a double-digit decrease in the number of murders across 69 major cities through September 2023 as compared to the same time period during 2022. This is not a time to relax our efforts. We have so much more to do. In May 2021, we launched our violent crime reduction strategy aimed at addressing the spike in violent crime that had occurred during the pandemic. Central to that strategy has been the importance of our partnerships, partnerships among federal law enforcement agencies who are assisting the fight against violent crime, partnerships with state and local law enforcement agencies tasked with protecting their local communities, and partnerships with the local communities themselves. As part of that strategy, we have been bringing to bear our technological tools, including advanced ballistics analysis, firearms tracing, crime gun intelligence centers, and local fusion cells to support joint law enforcement investigations to identify the principal sources of violent crime in specific local communities. We have also been bringing to bear our federal statutes and prosecutorial tools to arrest and convict the repeat offenders and criminal organizations that are the principal drivers of violent crime. In addition, we are making good use of the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act of 2022, known as BISCA, which expanded our authority to prosecute firearms traffickers and straw purchasers who buy guns for those barred by the law from possessing them. We have already charged over 300 defendants under that authority. And we are continuing to implement the enhanced background check requirements of BISCA for purchasers under the age of 2021, up under the age of 21. Today, we are announcing that in the 19 months since the act's passage, those checks have already kept 527 firearms out of the hands of young people who are prohibited from having them. We have also been utilizing our grant-making authorities to support the local anti-violence initiatives being led by both our law enforcement and our community partners. In this regard, we have focused on strengthening Project Safe Neighborhoods, which puts community partnerships, community trust, and violence prevention at the center of our anti-violent crime efforts. We are also funding community violence intervention initiatives that we know save lives. In light of the encouraging results we have seen in many parts of the country in 2022 and 2023, we are meeting today to build on those efforts. We will evaluate which local initiatives are working, how we can reinforce them, and how we can replicate those successful initiatives in places that have not yet seen the same improvements. One such place is Washington, D.C., and we will be sharing more about our additional efforts here very soon. As I said at the outset, we have so much more work to do. Violent crime is not just a threat to people's physical safety. It is a threat to their ability to freely go about their daily lives. Violent crime isolates people and communities. It deepens the fractures in our public life. And when it is not addressed, it can undermine people's trust in the government and in each other. This department and our state and local partners will not rest until every community in our country is safe from the scourge of violent crime. 
At the same time that we are seeing an encouraging downward trend in violent crime, we are also witnessing a deeply disturbing spike in threats against those who serve the public. In just the final months of 2023, the Department investigated and charged individuals with making violent threats against FBI agents, federal judges, including a Supreme Court justice, presidential candidates, members of Congress, members of the military, and election workers. Just this week, several bomb threats were made against courthouses across the country. U.S. Marshal Service, FBI, and our state and local partners are aggressively investigating those bomb threats, which constitute serious offenses. And just yesterday, we arrested and charged an individual with threatening to kill a member of Congress and his children. This is just a small snapshot of a larger trend that has included threats of violence against those who administer our elections, ensure our safe travel, teach our children, report the news, represent their constituents, and keep our communities safe. These threats of violence are unacceptable. They threaten the fabric of our democracy. Over the past several years, the Justice Department has dedicated itself to combating these threats. We are meeting here today to determine how we can double down on those efforts in the new year. Before beginning our meeting, I want to take a moment to recognize that tomorrow marks the third anniversary of the January 6th attack on the Capitol. For our country, January 6th was an unprecedented attack on the cornerstone of our system of government, the peaceful transfer of power from one administration to the next. For many of the law enforcement officers defending the Capitol on that day, January 6th was also dangerous, painful, and personal. On that day, officers were punched, tackled, and tased as they defended the Capitol and those inside. One officer was crushed in a door, and another was dragged down a flight of stairs. Officers were attacked with chemical agents that burned their eyes and skin. They were assaulted with pipes, poles, and other dangerous and deadly weapons. Over the course of, oh, I'll wait just one moment until the fire trucks pass. Over the course of several hours, law enforcement officers defending the Capitol sustained a barrage of repeated violent attacks. 140 officers were assaulted. We honor the officers who selflessly defended members of Congress and others inside the Capitol that day. Our efforts are with the loved ones who are grieving for the five officers who have lost their lives in the line of duty as a result of what happened to them on January 6. We must never forget the terrible violence inflicted on law enforcement officers on January 6. Since the January 6 attack, the Justice Department has engaged in what has become one of the largest and most complex and resource-intensive investigations in our history. We have initiated prosecutions and secured convictions across a wide range of criminal conduct on January 6, as well as in the days and weeks leading up to the attack. We have secured convictions of those who brutally assaulted officers at the Capitol. We have secured convictions against those who obstructed the certification of the presidential election. We have secured convictions of leaders of both the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers for seditious conspiracy. So far, we have charged over 1,250 individuals and obtained over 890 convictions in connection with the January 6th attack. Our work continues. As I said before, the Justice Department will hold all January 6th perpetrators at any level accountable under the law, whether they were present that day or were otherwise criminally responsible for the assault on our democracy. In the ongoing January 6 investigations and prosecutions led by U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia, Matt Graves, and Special Counsel Jack Smith, the Justice Department is abiding by the longstanding norms that ensure our independence and the integrity of our investigations. We are following the facts and the law wherever they lead. We are enforcing the law 
without fear or favor. We are honoring our obligation to protect the civil rights and civil liberties of everyone in our country. We are upholding the rule of law, and we are protecting the American people. With that, I'd like to turn over the meeting to Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco. Share any words you may have. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Mr. Attorney General. The Justice Department has no higher priority than keeping our communities safe. The law enforcement agencies represented here are essential to that mission, and I am proud to serve with them. Since the start of this administration, this department has been laser focused on targeting the most significant drivers of violent crime with gun violence at the very top of that list. Our strategy is data driven and it focuses on doing what we do best, acting as a force multiplier with our state and local law enforcement partners who, after all, are on the front lines of the fight against violent crime and deploying technology and other tools, cutting edge tools, to go after the individuals most responsible for crime in our communities. We're seeing returns on our efforts. After a peak during the pandemic, violent crime is on a downward trajectory, as the Attorney General discussed, including double digit drops in homicide rates across many major cities in this country. But communities across this country are still coming together in grief because of the devastation of gun violence, including just yesterday in a school shooting in Iowa that claimed the life of a sixth grader. We must continue to do all we can to reduce gun violence and protect the people we serve. Now, crime gun intelligence, the ability to trace the guns and the ballistics from crime scenes and to identify the most prolific repeat shooters is integral to our strategy, and it has been a game changer. That's because crime gun intelligence allows us to take those repeat shooters off the streets, to drive case closure rates up, and to drive violent crime rates down. Working with our state and local partners, the ATF is now tracing more illegally deployed firearms than ever before. With a database of over six million pieces of ballistics evidence, ATF has generated more than 800,000 investigative leads. These investigative leads help solve violent crimes and make our communities safer. We're committed to making ballistics and gun tracing and other crime gun intelligence tools available to every law enforcement agency in the country from the smallest towns to the biggest cities. Taking crime gun intelligence from a violent crime scene should be as standard as taking fingerprints from a criminal. Now, crime gun intelligence has also enabled us to maximize the benefits of the most significant gun safety legislation passed in the last 30 years, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. Among these common sense steps, this law enables the FBI to conduct enhanced background checks for prospective firearms purchasers under the age of 21, as uh, the Attorney General mentioned. And over the last year and a half, it ha these enhanced checks have kept 527 guns out of the hands of young people prohibited by law from possessing them. It helps the department also crack down on black market gun dealers who peddle deadly weapons and to increase prosecutions for unlicensed firearms dealing by 60% since 2021. Our intelligence-based violent crime strategy is also delivering in terms of arrests. Over the last year and a half, the U.S. Marshals Service has deployed crime data to target its fugitive apprehension efforts in areas with the highest violent crime rates. And then working with our state and local partners, they've arrested more than 6,700 of the nation's most violent fugitives, again, making our communities safer. So it's by working in tandem with our state and local partners that we can move the needle and continue this downward trajectory that we're seeing in the violent crime rates across the country. Just yesterday, our U.S. attorney in Maryland announced that homicides in Baltimore dropped by more than 20% this past year. 
thanks to strategic law enforcement initiatives and to community partnerships. The city of Detroit made a similar announcement the day before, reporting that it closed 2023 with the fewest homicides on record since 1966. That's in over 45 years. The lowest, the fewest homicides on record uh, in uh, over the last 45 years. And double-digit reductions in shootings and carjackings, again, thanks to their federal, state, and local partnerships. And on the West Coast, in October, the city of Sacramento announced an 18% reduction in violent crime, including a 40% reduction in homicides. Federal law enforcement partnered closely with local authorities in Sacramento on strategies to address violent crime and gun crime in particular. So as we start this new year, the declining murder and violent crime rates are undoubtedly good news. But while the trends are broad, they are not uniform. So we cannot and we will not relent. To the contrary, we need to double down on what works. That means more joint federal, state, and local efforts to target violent criminals, more investments in putting more cops on the beat, making more cutting-edge crime gun intelligence available to as many of our partners as possible, disrupting every aspect of the violence-fueled fentanyl supply and delivery chain, stopping the spread of ghost guns and devices like Glock switches that convert firearms into weapons of war, and of course, investing in our partnerships with state, local, and tribal law enforcement agencies across the country. The strategy is paying dividends, so we need to maintain our momentum. I want to thank the men and women of our law enforcement agencies for their tireless efforts to keep the country safe, protect civil rights, and uphold the rule of law. And I'm looking forward to our discussion this morning. Great. Thank you, everyone. What's the plan for this city? Uh, yeah, as I said, um, we will be announcing very soon additional uh, steps we're going to take with respect to Washington, D.C. Thank you all. Thank you.